Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Devanj. I'm a final year BA student for mechanical engineering. I'm from Harry Watt. Uh, the objective of this session is to speak for engineering. And uh, I decided, thus, I decided to choose a relatively simple topic. Uh, you know, something that's really understandable by everyone. Uh, my topic for today is the importance of design and material in engineering. So, uh, what exactly, what is the role of an engineer? What exactly is engineering? Uh, so, the role of an engineer. First is, of course, to design a solution, design solutions to a problem. Uh, there can be multiple solutions to a problem, and then you have to choose the right one. And then is to design better solutions to this, to, to the problem. So, some, uh, for example, if you look at the time when steam engine was invented, you know, People used coal as a fuel, and uh, which we realize now is that you know it's not really good because of its uh, carbon emissions. So we are coming up with alternative methods where you have uh, no carbon emissions. You are trying to generate a sustainable cycle. So you're trying to design a better solution, you know, to that existing problem. And the last bit at. There are instances whereby a solution might just be good enough. You know, the solution uh, is working out well for the problem. So at that point of time, what engineers do is we try to make the existing system more efficient. For example, you might have a turbine uh, that is generating electricity. So you want to make it efficient. So you try to maybe uh, find a, a better material for the turbine, you know, to increase the life cycle of maybe the turbine or uh, the improve the uh, movement of the turbine so you see you're trying to make the existing ones more efficient or even solar panels coming up with new sort of materials uh, so that you know they could uh, uh, they reflect less heat or allow minimal not heat i mean light and they allow minimal light to pass through uh, so that's that making that system efficient, you see. Uh, so that's exactly the role of an engineer. My topic for today. Uh, so these days, if you look around, everything is kind of getting urbanized. You know, you're having tall buildings, you're having skyscrapers, you're getting su you're getting super skyscrapers and mega skyscrapers. You know, uh, back then it was not possible. You know, in the 1890s and 1900s. Uh, tall buildings were not really allowed, you know, the government had a certain height limit and the reason for that is, uh, the, you know, to allow sunlight to reach the bottom of the facade. So facade is basically the front of the building. So for example, you have this first picture here. Uh, this is the old uh, building which was considered very tall. Uh, this is relatively short these days. Uh, this is this sort of height. So you see this is what we call the facade. So when the sun the sun wouldn't reach the bottom of the facade, you know uh, So that is why this height limit was imposed, but uh, this was actually solved later on by put, uh, Coming up with a solution by putting designing the buildings in such a way that they are set back so the light can reach the facade of the bottom of the facade uh, and the next big challenge that we face these days is uh, wind load. You know, uh, as the building get taller and taller, you know the number of obstacles uh, that are there are less. So the wind directly hits uh, the building, and you know this causes stress, uh, some serious stress. So, for example, you can see this is a sim scale model of Burj Khalifa at the top, and this is a sim scale of random uh, tall building. So, what happens is on the right, you can see there's a black obstacle here. Uh, uh, if you see this obstacle here, this is uh, a tall building, and there's light, there's air that is flowing around. But do you see these empty spaces? These are actually called the bluff areas. So what happens is these bluff areas are called vortex. So 
let's look at vortex for example these are these represent building you know this is the top view of a building and a random shape you know of how the building looks so you see that there is air really flowing around this uh, building and you have these bluff areas these bluff areas is uh, and when you have multiple uh, bluff areas it's called vortex shedding shedding so what happens when you have vortex shedding so when you have vortex shedding first of all the building is experiencing stress because of the wind next when you have bluff areas that means there's a low pressure area which is being created so it's more like a vacuum and there's a suction force which has been created which causes the building to move in this direction you know and it's designed to be in this specific position so the building starts swaying back and forth you know which is not really pleasant for the person inside the building of course so how do we solve this problem is through design by altering the design you actually solve a lot of these problems for example this is again a, a same scale model of the building so for example you have a, a circle a building here you know this is the top view of the building and then by altering the design so imagine you have a smooth surface and you see this area here this is called the facade because this is the front part of the building so as the wind hits this uh, facade and then starts to go around it starts creating vortexes you see uh, your edge you see this vortex you see this is a bluff area here so uh, what happens is when you have a wind that is hitting the facade and at a certain frequency and this frequency when it matches the frequency of uh, the vortex which, uh, which is being created you know the movement is really strong and you can actually feel it anyone that's inside the building can definitely feel it you know, it's that something that you don't want because the building could simply rupture and you know could lead to a disaster. So here's how this design was, uh, this problem was solved through design by creating rough surfaces. You see, the size of the vortex could be reduced, and if you reduce the size of the vortex, you're decreasing the strength of the vortex. So you see here. So if you see this uh, coefficient of drag here is 0.98. And the coefficient of drag is 0.57 so there is a 42 percent reduction but then you could have a hybrid design whereby the facade still has a smooth surface but the top region is uh you know is the coefficient of drag is 0.3 you know and in total there's a 69.5 percent reduction in the wind load you know from the existing one so you kind of solve the problem but this is something this sort of design is really not feasible because you know uh, not all buildings are going to be round and also this sort of rough design it's a bit hard to make it's also costly of course so most of the buildings that you see these days are having sh uh, in the past you could see had sharp edges so we try to alter this uh, so how do we alter it? First of all, anywhere that we see, anywhere where we see a sharp edge, we try to turn it into a small curve. So for example, if you have a building that is this way, we could change it to something like that. You see there's a curve here. Or you could even change it to something like this. You see, you're still solving the existing problem. You are... Is, Sorry, my design. So you get the point. You see, you're making these small cuts. So you make the building more aerodynamic, you know. Uh, and this is called corner softening. You're actually softening the corners. And you will actually see this in most of the buildings. The next way uh, to, uh, to alter the design is by tapering. In tapering, you're actually uh, decreasing the width of the uh, of the building as you ascend upwards you see and as you ascend upwards and you're decreasing the width you're actually again this method actually decreases the strength of the vortex so you know the swaying is, is so minimal that you can actually neglect it and you know uh, the stress that's acting on the building is you know 
it's not gonna cause any sort of failure then openings you know uh, the reason for this sort of openings is having uh, you allow air to flow through and around the building so in this way uh, you know there is merely any vortex created and uh, no vortex created so there's no suction force and you're good to go and then you have altering the building profile by you know uh, uh, by having by continuously changing the width as you ascend upwards you will see more as you see examples so uh, let's look at these examples again uh, this example sorry so this is the Taipei Tower uh, you know uh, this is in Taiwan this is the Shanghai Tower and this is the Kuala Lumpur uh, Twin Towers Petronas Towers as, you, as someone said so you see to, as you you see this building design as the uh, building ascends upwards there's a change in profile and also there's also a method of a bit of uh, corner softening over here uh, and also uh, there is a bit of tapering because you can see there's a, designs something like this you know you have the profile at the towards the top that has been altered you know which is making the building more aerodynamic again this one, this design has no sharp edges and it has a twisting profile, uh, which is again making the building very aerodynamic. And this Petronas Towers over here, they have one of the best designs uh, because it has a continuous change in its profile. At the same time, there's a bit of corner softening you can see over here and also uh, a bit of tapering towards the top. Now, uh, this is the New York Park Avenue and this is the Kingdom Tower in Saudi Arabia. So these two buildings, you see there's a big gap. Uh, this is not because this place couldn't be rented out. This was actually part of the design. This figure is actually the zoom in of this one. So uh, when you increase, when you have this sort of uh, gaps, you're actually increasing the porosity of the building. So when you increase the porosity as you go up, you're allowing air to flow through again and also around, which again, you know, has uh, minimal stress. The vortex sizes are really small and the suction force is negligible. And you see here, this building has no tapering, no uh, softened corners. It's more round, but has a really... Uh, different design you see the size of the amount you see the size and area here the amount of air that could flow through this is really high uh, you know making the building again aerodynamic now this is the alternate approach that the Taipei tower has uh, as I mentioned earlier so this basically is a massive damper uh, what happens is as uh, some areas are actually really prone to wind so uh, the wind load is really high so when you have such techniques you know you're not sure whether it will work under high wind conditions you know so they put a massive load so when the building tries to sway this massive load also sways so which counteracts this motion causing the building not to sway you know uh, this is a relatively new technique uh, it's still it's new and many future buildings where future skyscrapers uh, plan to initiate this there are some towers also uh, future towers they plan to install wind turbines but uh, it's not really attractive so uh, people don't use it for some reason but they prefer to go for the damper compared to the wind turbine at the top of the tower next uh, the importance of material uh, you saw that how the design plays a crucial role in, in buildings. The same way materials, whether it's building or any sort of design, they play a major role, you know. For example, the building, uh, they use iron and steel bars and uh, concrete as the main material. So these materials are selected, you know, because they have them they can they can absorb the stress they can bend and reflect you know this is the main reason for choosing this sort of material 
So when you talk about the history of humans you had, or the history of civilization, you are actually honestly talking about the history of materials, you know. We even refer to our past uh, using materials, for example. We have the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, uh, we have the Gold and Steel Age, and now we have the Silicon Age. So even uh, throughout, the, throughout history, you know, materials have always played an, an important role uh, in our life. This is Liberty Ship. So this is more like a case study for you guys. Uh, so, for example, this, this was the ship that was used between the period of 1941 and 1945 in World War II. So the US decided to manufacture these ships. There were almost around 2,700 ships that were built during this period. Uh, period and they were designed to carry a certain amount of payload and travel at a certain speed. You know, but this uh, ship, it experienced massive failure, you know, the failure was straight from the center, uh, the ship literally cracked from the center, and you will see why, why that crack played a crucial role, uh, you know, in, in understanding the behavior of material. So before I proceed, it's important to understand the basics of uh, material science. So first you have the stress and strain curve. So we use this curve to understand how the material behaves upon certain stress and how much strain it experiences when that uh, stress is applied. So this region here is the elastic deformation region. Elastic deformation means when the material experiences stress, you know, uh, when it returns back to its, uh, when the stress is released, the material comes back to its original shape. Uh, yield stress, this is the maximum stress, allowable stress you could say, after which the material will not deform elastically but start to deform plastically, you know, and this is the maximum strength after which the material experiences necking and fracture. But not all materials behave this way, for example, let's say plastics or uh, metals, they behave in a tactile manner, that's why they follow this sort of relationship, but when a material is brittle, you have no, you see in the tactile material, before the material fails, you have some sort of bonding. You know, you see a bit of uh, plastic deformation, you see necking process taking place, and then you have failure or rupture. But in brittle material, you don't get this sort of bonding. The material just fractures and there is no going back after that. So, the Liberty ship, this was a crack that happened, and it wasn't just one ship. It was actually for multiple ships, you know, the, the ship literally cracked from the center and, uh, you know, it, it failed and everyone was wondering what's wrong, you know, because uh, steel was used and steel behaves in a ductile manner. Uh, why did the ship fail, you know, uh, and then later it was found out that the ships were failing. It was because it was the winter time. Uh, the temperature was below four degrees, you know, and uh, when it's below 4 degrees, steel starts behaving in a brittle manner. You see uh, how we understand, uh, how much we need to understand the materials is how this small, this sort of temperature change, you know, it's during the manufacturing of the ship, no one even would have even thought about it. But the ship just cracked. Luckily, it wasn't many ships that failed, but the number was significant. For example, the other uh, case study where material played a, a, a great role was during the Wright Brothers period. So back then, you know, aluminium was yet to be discovered. Uh, you know, the, uh, it was just really new. It was during the 19, it was I think during 1910s. And uh, this was, the entire aircraft was designed using wood. You know, and uh, the engine here was painted black because at that point of time, aluminium was relatively new, so people were still using steel engines. But somehow the Wright brothers came across this aluminium engine and decided to paint it black, so no one would know about it. So that's why it's known as the Wright brothers with the black engine, because at that point of time, no one really knew where did that engine come from, you know, because uh, the weight of the engine was steel and iron, en uh, steel engines and iron engines. They have really uh, 
huge mass, uh, which is not really good for the aircraft that is built out of wood, you know. So this is Alfred Bloom, uh, the man behind the wonder material aluminium. So aluminium back then was really pure and you know it was really malleable, so you could not use it for any, anything. Uh, and to harden a the material, the experience they go through a process called quenching. Uh, this process is actually used for when you cast any sort of metal, you have to you know make it go through the quenching process. So quenching is basically after you cast the metal, you dip it in uh, liquid water or gas, not gas, I mean oil, and uh, you know this basically rapidly cools the uh, the cast metal and it hardens it. Uh, this is the technique which has been applied. But for some reason, it didn't work for aluminium, you know. So Alfred decided to try it using uh, an alloy. So 4% copper and 96% aluminium. So he tried the same thing with, uh, with uh, copper alloy of aluminium, uh, but it didn't behave. It, it showed this sort of relationship. You see, the amount of stress it could take was really minimal, and he didn't. Uh, he did this on a, on a Friday uh, evening and it didn't work so he decided you know he was not happy with the results so he decided to just close his workshop and come back next week so when he came back next week he found out that uh, the aluminium that he had uh, cast and after it had experienced the quenching process over time upon after it aged a certain bit it started to behave in this manner. So if you give it time to age, uh, you know, it, it behaves in a, in, a, in a right manner. And uh, why does it do that? So imagine this is how this is pure uh, aluminium. When you apply certain force, it experiences plastic deformation. But now you add copper atoms, you see, uh, these copper atoms, and you they still behave in the same way, but you give it certain time, use the right proportion of copper material, uh, ratio of between copper and aluminium, and give it the right temperature, uh, then it starts to develop a second phase, you know, which creates, a, a, and over time it creates a strong bond, cohesive bond between the copper atoms and aluminium atoms, which allowed aluminium to be used for wider scales. And this was the first aircraft called Junkers J1, uh, 12th December 1915. It was the first aircraft to be made completely using aluminium. So you see the importance of uh, design and materials uh, throughout history in engineering. And why do I find it interesting? Why do I find engineering beautiful? Is because not only we solve problems, but we we use the most simple uh, principles or natural phenomena that are there and we use that to do something really big you know for example uh, you have an engine you know that simply works using uh, a temperature difference you know so it's something that is really small that you see around you maybe inspired from inspired from nature and you try to use that those principles to do something really big. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Hope you found my lecture interesting. Thank you.